church, how are we doing? There is one true living God who deserves our praise, amen? So wherever we're at in this place, from the front to the back, let's give God our best praise this morning. Come on, here we go. You are the one true eternal King, and all creation sings. Yeah. You are the one different from the rest. There's resurrection in your breath. So we call out to the wind, let revival begin. Come on, let's sing. Spirit of the living God, who was and is and is to come, breathe on us. In your name we prophesy, one was dead now comes to life, breathe on us. Would you breathe on us? You are the one Time will not outlast You hold our future in our past You are the one The great could not contain i 
There's honey in the rock. Come on, church, we sing. There's honey in the rock. Oh, there's honey in the rock. Yeah, there's honey in the rock.
sin was deep, but your grace was deeper, and my shame was wide. Your arms were wider, and my guilt was great. Your love was greater. Still. Come on, if you've ever felt that, would you lift your hands and sing this with me? Let me sing. My sin was deep, your grace was deeper, and my shame was wide. Your arms were wider, and my guilt was great. Your love was greater.
goodness of God. Isn't he good? He's a good guy. You know, I love reading through the Psalms because as you read, especially the writings of David in the Psalms, he writes of his experiences. And over and over and over again, as David writes, you know, the voice of experience, talking about life. I've been so many places. I've been in mountaintops. I've been in valleys. I've been in battles. I've walked through the camp of Israel holding the giant's head in my hand. I've been in all kinds of places. But in every place that I've ever been, I've found that God is a faithful God. And I love, I love what he says in Psalms 23. In all the places I've walked, all the places that I've gone, the unusual things I've seen, surely goodness and mercy follows me every single day of my life. Aren't you glad for that today? That's just one more reason to trust Jesus because goodness and mercy is following. Some of us are so caught up in the hassle of the moment we fail to stop and look over our shoulder. Goodness and mercy is right there on our heels. God is a faithful God. Can we just lift our hands and give God praise? Father, we trust you today. As we close our worship time for these next few moments god we just lift our hands and say thank you that no matter where i go no matter what i face what i'm dealing with goodness and mercy is right there you're a good god you're a faithful god you've never let me down and you will never ever let me fail for a moment father i just give you praise today i honor you i glorify you because it is your nature to be a faithful god and we trust that today God, I thank you as we look forward into the future. There are people in this room, they've got some major, major questions, not sure what's next and where to go from here. But as you lead them, your goodness and your mercy will always be with them every day of their lives. And we thank you for that today. We honor the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's give God praise just one more time. I love those words. All my life, all my days, you have been faithful. Hey, I'm so glad to see you in church this morning. Speaking of faithful, you're faithful people, and I appreciate you being here. Great, great service plan today. If you would, just turn around and say hi to a few folks before you're seated this morning, and we'll proceed. family. My name is Trinity. We are so happy to see you in church today. Here are a few things coming up in church life. Lift Off Kids Summer Day Camp is just two weeks away. We are gearing up for a great week with your first through fifth grade kiddos, and we don't want them to miss out. All of the fun is happening June 26th through the 29th with bounce houses, inflatable slides, games, crafts, skits, and so much more. Not only that, but we know your kids will connect with God and other kids. It's going to be a great week, so be sure to get your kids registered. Hey, Bridge Church family, we'd like to invite you to join us on a tour of Israel. That's right. We are planning our next Holy Land tour, April 2nd through 12th, 2024. There's nothing like walking where Jesus walked and being in the places we've only read about in the Bible. It really is a trip of a lifetime. Yes, it is. We hope you'll join us. If you are interested, we invite you to come to an informational meeting on Sunday, June 20th. 25th at 10:45 a.m. between our Sunday services in Multipurpose One. We hope to see you there. We are very excited to let you know about something new that is coming up here at the bridge. 
In the month of July and August, we will be having summer nights events here at the church. The first is a family movie night on Friday, July 7th at 6.30 p.m. There will be free popcorn for everyone as well as candy and drinks for purchase. And these summer nights events are not just for our church family, but they are a great opportunity to invite your friends, family, and neighbors to connect with our church family. So round up your friends, family, and neighbors and join us for our first summer nights on July 7th here at The Bridge. That's what's happening here at The Bridge. We look forward to seeing you next week for Dad's Day at The Bridge. Thanks for being in church with us today. Good morning, Bridge family. It's good to see you in church today. We're thrilled that you are in the house of God, and we especially want to take this opportunity to welcome you if you are new to the church. Maybe you're brand new today. Maybe this is your very first time at the bridge, or perhaps you're just newer to the church, haven't yet gotten connected. We want to say welcome. Thank you so much for being in the house today. If you are new to the bridge, first of all, we just want to welcome you and say, hey, stop by the info center before you go. As soon as you step out this first set of exit doors before you exit today, hang a right, stop by the info center, and our team will be there to meet you. You might have questions about the church, you know, who we are, what we're all about, and how you can get plugged in. They'll be happy to answer your questions to the best of their ability, tell you more about the church, and help you get plugged in. You know, our mission statement here at the bridge is to connect people with God and connect people with people. So our prayer and our hope this morning is that you have an encounter with God where you meet with him today. But not only that, we hope that you connect with some of the great people that called the bridge home. So thank you very, very much for being in church today. We're glad that you are here. Bridge family, can we put our hands together and welcome our guests to church today? Awesome. We are in a series right now called Balance. We're actually concluding it today, and we're stepping into Dad's Day next weekend where we celebrate all of the dads. But we're going to wrap up the series today called Balance. And what we've done over three weeks is we've brought up some topics that can sometimes be controversial, but that's not the point of the series. We don't want to get into controversy. We just want to look at some things that sometimes we get a little bit out of balance in our walk with God. In week one, we talked about prosperity. Is that even in the scriptures? What does the Bible say about it? Is there such thing as biblical prosperity? Does God want me to have that? We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. And if you didn't catch it, I hope you'll jump online and listen to that. Last week, Pastor Gary brought a phenomenal message about the gifts of the Spirit. He even said so himself. He said, that was good. <laughs> well, we hope you've been enjoying this series that we're in because, listen, we don't want to get extreme on one end of a topic or extreme on the other end. We want to find balance. What does the Word of God have to say about these things? So that's what we've been talking about over the last two Sundays. And today we're going to wrap up by talking about something that really isn't controversial, but sadly, we can get it out of balance in our Christian lives. And today we're going to talk about the church. What is the proper view of the church from Scripture? What is my part in the church? What am I required to be when it comes to the church, and what should the church require of me? We're going to talk a little bit about those things, and let me just give you some examples of where I want to talk about today. For many believers, there was a great emphasis placed on church participation on a weekly basis to the point that they see church attendance as a primary way of pleasing God and often hoping that the church will be their primary source of joy and fulfillment. On the other hand, many Christians disregard church participation altogether, seeing their faith as a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God and placing no responsibility upon themselves in relation to the church. Not only that, but sometimes Christians can have an unrealistic expectation of the church or place unrealistic expectations on the church, expecting it to provide things for them that only God can provide. And likewise, sometimes the church can be incredibly unreasonable with people, 
and place unreasonable expectations on people, requiring more of them than what God is reasonably requiring of them. Sometimes church can get a little bit out of balance, or perhaps we can even have an unbalanced view of church ourselves. And there's a lot to be said about this and a lot of different ways that we could go. So what's the correct view for Christians to have on the church? Perhaps the reason many Christians get this wrong is because we do not have a correct understanding on what the church really is. Before we go any further, I just want to take this moment because we need to establish one core principle here at the outset of the message. As Christians, church is not a place that we go. The church is who we are. You see, the church is not a building. The church is people. The church is not a place, the church is a people. The church is not a pastor, thank God, the church is a people. The church is not a brand, it's a people. The church is not a denomination, it's a people. And as Eugene Peterson wrote in the Message Bible, the church is not peripheral to the world, the world is peripheral to the church. And when we understand that we are the church of Jesus Christ, we realize that we, you, And me are God's plan A for reaching our world, and there is no plan B. So if God has a high view, if God has a high view of his church, shouldn't we have a pretty good view of it too? Or a high view of it, or an accurate view of it, at the very least. Now, again, there's a lot that we could take from the scriptures about what the church is, or more specifically, who the church is. But During the time that we have today, I want to establish three core principles, and then we're going to ask some really interesting questions that are relevant to today and the day and age in which we live, okay? So if you're taking notes, I want to give you these things really briefly this morning to set a foundation for what we're going to talk about. Number one, as the church of Jesus Christ, we are people who walk in light. As the church of Jesus Christ, we are people who walk in light. And this is one that we overlook a lot, I think, in the church world. We don't talk enough about what the scriptures say about we, the church, we believers, we Christians, being the light of the world. You know, Jesus said it this way in Matthew 16, and we'll have the scriptures on the screen in just a moment, but you have to understand it in context. Jesus had sent his disciples out, and they're ministering in the name of Jesus. They come back to him, and Jesus, like, wants to take a survey, So what's going on? What are you hearing? What are people saying? And he asked this specific question. He says, who do people say that I am? And when he asks that question, he gets different responses from the disciples. They say, well, some say that you're Moses. Some say you're Elijah. Some say that you're John the Baptist. And Jesus hears them out, and he says, okay, cool. That's what everybody else was saying. But then he asks them the all-important question that all of us have to answer, but who do you say that I am? And we pick it up right there. In verse 17, because Peter or Simon has answered this question, he said, I believe, Jesus, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says this to him. He said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. In other words, you don't believe that just because someone told it to you, but my Father in heaven has revealed it to you. And I say to you that you are Peter or Petros, you're a rock, that's what the name means. And on this rock I will build my church, And the gates of Hades or hell shall not prevail against it. Now, I think maybe most of us would know this passage of Scripture, and we understand that in the New Testament, this is the first place that the word church is translated. And when Jesus uses this word in the Greek translation or the original writings, the word here, of course, is ekklesia. It's a compound word with a preposition and a verb, and it means to be called out. And so we can look at that word ecclesia for church and understand that's a definition of it. But I think sometimes if we only look at that definition, we can leave that and and it becomes a little bit vague to us. Because as I read it, it brings up two interesting questions when I see the word ecclesia. If ecclesia or church means to be called out, it makes me wonder if I'm being called out, what am I being called out of and what am I being called into? And I think that question demands an answer today. So get this. This is so cool. Jesus says that right there in Matthew 16. But I think the best answer we find is given to us actually by Peter, the one that Jesus was speaking to. 
Look at 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. Peter writes these words. He says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of, watch this, him who called you out, out of what? Out of darkness and into what? His marvelous light. As believers, as Christians, as the church of Jesus Christ, we are people who walked out of darkness. We've been called out of it, and we are now walking in his marvelous light. I love that picture. Now, we see further confirmation of this in Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to actually spend some time in Ephesians 5 today. Paul writes it this way. He says, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So what now? So walk as children of light. So one more time, the first thought I want to give you this morning is that as Christians, as the church of Jesus Christ, we are people or we are children who walk in the light, all right? Here's the second thought. Number two, as the church of Jesus Christ, we are the bride of Christ. As the church of Jesus Christ, we are the bride of of Christ. And we see multiple explanations for this in the New Testament, but staying in Ephesians 5 for just a moment. It says this, and don't everybody get nervous. We're going to talk about marriage right now or anything like that. But this is where we draw this analogy from right here. Ephesians 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. And husbands, oh yeah, you're not left out here. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So we see that, number one, we are people who walk in light, but now we see that we are the bride of Christ. Not only those two scriptures, but we also see in all four gospels Jesus telling parables or referring to himself as the bridegroom to connect his relationship with the church, which is his bride. So I want to say it one more time. As the church of Jesus Christ, we, you and me, are the bride of Christ. Everybody with me so far? All right, now here's the third thought as we go further into the message. As the church of Jesus Christ, we are the body of of Christ. We're the body of Christ. And this is a teaching that perhaps we're a little bit more familiar with than the bride of Christ teaching, but this is the way Paul teaches it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says in verse 20, but now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hands, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Look at verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. So each one of us are individual members, but what good is a member if it's not connected to the rest of the body? So we have to understand that we combine collectively together are the body of Christ. I'm going to say these one more time so you catch all three of them if you didn't take notes. We are the people who walk in light, number one. Number two, we are the bride of Christ. And number three, we are the body of Christ. During the rest of our time together, I want to attempt to answer some questions that are asked a lot these days and answer these from Scripture that, that these questions have uh, sometimes are, they reveal to us just how unbalanced our view of church can often be, all right? So if you're taking notes, here's the first question I want to ask this morning. Do I have to go to church to be a Christian? How many have heard that one before? How many have said that before? Don't raise your hand. Sorry. Do I have to go to church to be a Christian? I'll never forget several years ago, um, probably six or seven years ago, I read an interview with a very famous celebrity entertainer who was very open about their faith, claiming to be a Christian. And it was actually an interview in Rolling Stone magazine. This gentleman was asked, you know, so you're, you claim to be a Christian? And he says, yes. He says, well, are you a part of a local church? And he says, well, no, I'm really not a part of a local church, but you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. My wife and I, in the church that we were a part of when we met, our pastor used to ask this question occasionally, do I have to go to church to be a Christian? And he said something interesting that I'll always remember. He said, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sleeping in the garage makes you a car. (laughs) And I've held on to that because, as it turns out, it's true. Now, listen, do I have to go to church to be a Christian? Or you don't have to go to church to be a Christian? 
Technically speaking, if that's what we confine the church to, technically speaking, I guess that's true, that you don't have to go to church in order to be a Christian. The only problem is when I define church as a place that I go, then the premise of the question is flawed. Why? Because if I merely see the church as a place that I go, then I've misunderstood the bigger picture of what I am a part of. Everybody follow me so far? Some of us get excited. We're going to go further in a minute. You might not get as excited. Corey, chill out, all right? Now, let's take a moment and address this question from the perspective of these truths which we've established already. Do I have to go to church to be a Christian? Well, first of all, we said from 1 Peter 2 and Ephesians 5 that we are the people who walk in light. We are children of light. I remember when I was a kid... When I was growing up, I went to Angelus Crest Christian Camp when I was in elementary school, and I went there with a bunch of kids that were in my school because I went to a, a Christian elementary school. And I remember going there, and at night, we would have our services in the evening in the amphitheater, and we would leave the amphitheater, and we would go back to our cabins, you know, to change clothes, to get some things, whatever, and then we would head back for, like, the late-night activities that we had after the services. And I'll I always remember this so vividly because I was a kid. You know, when you're young, you're afraid of the dark. And they would always tell us to bring a flashlight. That was one of the things on the list, bring a flashlight. And when I was a kid, my parents didn't send me to camp with like a big mag light, you know, with a million candle power brightness or whatever. I had like that little cheap little plastic flashlight that had a battery, like the button was like really hard to push. And when it lit up, it illuminated very dimly. You know what I'm saying? And you would walk through this like very dark area from where the amphitheater was to the cabin. And if you're by yourself, all you have is this tiny little light. And it was like such a relief when your friends came, and even though they might not have had mag lights either, they were all coming and bringing their little lights, and collectively, our lights illuminated the place where we were going. See, many of us tend to think that we can navigate the darkness of the world around us with just our little individual light. I'm not saying that there's not something special and significant about this little light of yours, and you should let it shine. You should. <laughs> Hide it under a bushel? No. You need to let it shine, but the point is, my light is just one light, but when my light connects with your light, we got something cooking. And I know that this is a really simple illustration and analogy, but I think a lot of us look around, even as believers, and we will confess that this is a dark world we're living in, yet we're trying to navigate it all by ourselves with our tiny little light. Again, not to take away or diminish the significance of your light, but my light's a whole lot better when it's connected to your light. We are people who are called to walk in light. And the light's so much brighter when we are doing it together. So many things I just keep on saying here, but listen, if we will surround ourselves and walk alongside other people of light, we discover that the brightness of our collective light overpowers the darkness around us, causing us to walk in clarity and enabling each of us to reach our God-appointed destination. Do you realize that you are so much more capable of reaching your God-appointed calling and destination when you're not doing it by yourself, but you're doing it with other people? Because the light is so much brighter when we put them all together. Not only that, but when those around us see the light in which we are walking, our collective light makes room for others to get on that path that God has for them and for their lives as well. It's amazing what happens when your world, your neighbors, your friends, your family look at the light that you are walking and say, hey, can you take some of that light and shed it on my path? And what do we do? We say, hey, why don't you come over here and walk on this one with us? Because something amazing happens when we don't choose to walk out this life with God with just me and my little light. But no, we collectively come together and we combine our light. And when I understand that the church is not just a place that I go, but a community that I'm a part of, I recognize that connecting with the church family is an invitation to walk in that light. We could stay here a whole lot longer, but we've got to keep going, all right? Now, here's another question I want to throw at you. Second question this morning. Okay, so I like the idea of being connected in the church, but I'm not sure I'm ready to trust people just yet. How do I know that I'm not going to get hurt? How do I know that if I 
open up my life, I connect with other people, I become a little bit vulnerable with other people. How do I know that I'm not gonna get hurt? And you see, this brings us to a topic that has become very, very popular on the internet and social media these days among Christians. And I'm so hesitant to even use this phrase because it brings up a lot of weird connotations, but I'm just gonna use it anyway because I think it's gonna relate to everyone. The hashtag that has become so overused, church hurt. Christians love to talk about church hurt these days. Like I said, that hashtag has become a popular and heavily used slogan for people have been hurt in some, for people who have been hurt in some way or another in church or by a church they've been in, by somebody they've been doing life or church with, maybe even by a leader. And listen, to deny that sometimes people don't get wounds or hurts or offenses in church would be really foolish and dishonest because sadly, even in the church, sometimes stuff happens. And can I just say this morning that maybe you're here in the house and like you have this wall built up around you of hesitance because of some sort of offense or hurt or wound that's taken place. I don't know anything else to say except this from the very bottom of my heart. Man, I'm so sorry that that happened to you within the body of Christ. I'm sorry that that happened. But here's the deal. It usually comes in the form of disappointments, offenses, slander, or failures by leaders or fellow church members. And sadly, sometimes people can get hurt by other people in the church, and when it happens, it's not okay. There's no defending it. An offense where, you, where you've been wronged by somebody, it's not okay. And to sweep it under the rug and pretend that it was okay isn't okay. And we need to say that out loud, but listen, Often the reason these wounds tend to cut so deep is because we place an expectation of perfection on other Christians. And it's important to remember that while we are all attempting to follow a perfect God, the church is comprised of very imperfect people. And when we put expectations of perfection on imperfect people, we are always setting ourselves up for disappointment. For many people, church hurt starts with a small, treatable wound. Sometimes it's a bigger one. I understand that. But for many people, church hurt starts with a small, treatable wound. And if we will allow the wound to be treated, we can move forward in health. But sadly, when many Christians are wounded in the church, we take offense, we run away from healing, and we put up walls around us that prevent restoration from flowing into our lives. And when we do this, we become isolated and vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy because of the offense that we experience. And listen, the offense might be legit, but that doesn't mean that God wants you to stay hurt. I believe with all my heart that God wants to bring healing into your life. Let's go a little bit further though, okay? What are the dangers of wounds and infections? See, church hurt often leads to individual members of the body of Christ being disconnected or cut off from the body. Church hurt usually starts as a wound, but left untreated quickly becomes an infection. And over the years, I've seen people who have experienced some sort of wounds in church life, and they allow those wounds to go untreated, and once they become infected, the infection usually manifests itself in the form of criticism and cynicism of everybody else around them. Now, I'm not being critical to those who've experienced hurts. Please hear my heart this morning. We are a church that believes that God wants to heal the hurts of the past. And we will always stand on that principle that our God is a God who heals. And when I become critical and cynical within the body of Christ, what I'm really saying is that I give, listen to this if you have to catch this. What I'm really saying is I give myself permission to be a work in progress while expecting perfection from everyone else around me. Wow. I live by one standard, but I'm gonna make you live by another. <laughs> and sometimes that's what happens when we get an infection from a hurt or offense that we've experienced in the past. When we experience hurts or wounds in church life, we will often pull away and disconnect. But look again at what the scripture says about the body of Christ. Watch this, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 20. But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. Many members, us, but we together are one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. 
You see, when I disconnect from the body of Christ because of a hurt or an offense, I'm saying to the other members, I have no need of you. And when we disconnect from the body of Christ, two things usually happen. We lose our individual purpose or function within the body, and we are no longer hearing from Christ. Why? Because we are now disconnected from the head, Christ, the head of the church. So, What gives the body directions? The head. Christ is the head of the church. We are the body of Christ. You guys got quiet on me all of a sudden. Corey, it's okay to be loud again. We have to be really, really careful if we ever walk through difficult seasons where I'm not talking about something huge, major headline thing, but when someone just rubs us the wrong way at church and it creates this offense that we don't allow that little wound to become an infection, which suddenly makes us critical or cynical, because over time what happens is when, that, when we allow that to happen, we allow it to set in, we disconnect from the body, and suddenly we lose our function, we lose our purpose, and we're no longer hearing from Christ because we're disconnected from the body and the head. We have to be so careful that we don't fall into that trap. And imagine with me for just a moment, this is so silly, but imagine walking along, and I, I don't want to be insensitive because I recognize sometimes there are people who have had accidents, you know, wounds, Maybe something happened at birth where there's a limb or or a body part that's missing or something, and perhaps a prosthetic or something like that. I don't say this to be offensive. But I can't imagine walking down the street with people and seeing a foot over here by itself attempting to walk. Just a foot. Because we would all look at it and say, hey, that's a foot. I recognize what it is. I know what its function is. The only problem is it's not serving a purpose because it's not connected to a leg. And see, when the scripture says that the eye can't look at the rest of the body and say, I have no need of you, the head can't look at the rest of the body and say, I have no need of you, I've always thought of that in comparison terms, where one part looks at the other part and says, I'm better than you, or I'm lesser than you, so therefore I don't need you. But I've never thought of it this way. Sometimes we can allow hurts to come in where we will look at everybody that God wants us to be connected with, and we will say, I have no need of you because there's just too much risk. And when we cut that off, one of the things that often happens is we cut off the very thing that God wants to use to bring healing in our lives, and that's other believers. One of the great principles of the church, if we want to grow in our walk with God, one of the great principles of the church, you ready for this? Vulnerability. Church requires me to be a little bit vulnerable, to open up, to give of myself, to receive from you. Listen, a lot of us, we have no problem giving of ourselves. I got something to say to you for everything you're going through. But man, do we struggle opening up and allowing someone else to speak into our life. God wants to use other people to speak into your life. And if we can't heal from the wounds of the past, we will never have that available to us where God wants to use somebody else to bring healing to our life. There has to be a clear understanding of what it means to be the body of Christ. And not only that, but before we go to the next thing here, I want to point out another thing. We talk about being the body of Christ. We all need each other. What about this? When it comes to criticism and cynicism or hurts that we've experienced in the past, when the scriptures tell us that we are the bride of Christ, you know, you can tell me that you love me and we can be friends and buddy-buddy and we can hug it out and we can hang out, but if you tell me that you don't like my wife, we might have a problem. In fact, if you want to walk around insulting my wife, we most definitely have a problem. Don't tell me you love me if you're going to say another thing about my wife. I wonder how Jesus feels when we become critical and cynical toward his church. I know this sounds like a lecture. I'm not trying to sound mean-spirited. But there's something to be said. We find a lot of reasons why we disconnect ourselves from the body of Christ. And we have to make sure that we stay connected to the body of Christ because we collectively are the bride of Christ as well. Now, this brings us to another question that I want to ask today. And I'm going to have to move through this quickly because of time, but next question is, okay, I understand that I need to be connected to the body of Christ, but can I only do that by being in church on Sundays? Is it the same thing to be a part of the online church? Oh, this is going to be, just stay with me, all right? Is it the same thing to be a part of the online church? Can I be connected to the body of Christ Virtually, can I be a virtual Christian? (laughs) That just sounds funny. That's not a condemning word to those who are watching online. I'm using funny language. But I want you to notice a couple of things here. And this is something we've talked about in the past 
here at the bridge. Man, we walked through a difficult season three years ago when we weren't gathering for a little while together in the house. Hebrews 10, Hebrews 10. The writer of Hebrews says it this way, watch this. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. And then the verse that we know well, verse 25, not forsaking, everybody say forsaking. forsaking. The assembling, everybody say assembling, assembling. of ourselves as, the, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now I wanna show you really quickly. There are two words there that we just said out loud that stand out to me. First of all, he says don't forsake. The word forsake in its original meaning literally means to neglect or to disregard. But watch this. He then goes on and he says, don't neglect or disregard the assembling. Now, I read this so much of my life up until the last two or three years, not seeing the word assembling, but seeing the word assembly with a Y. Because when we're growing up, we go to school assemblies. What is it? It's just a big gathering where we all get together and somebody shares something and somebody says something. But you go back to the original writings, you get to look at the first King James translation, and the word here is not assembly, it's assembling. And it's a picture not of us getting together and just looking at one another or the person who's on stage. No, it's assembling where each and every individual member comes together with all of the other ones. See, this isn't just a big meeting with a lot of people filling seats. This is all of us as the body of Christ coming together and joining our lives together. And watch this. Notice that the writer of Hebrews doesn't say, don't forsake the teaching of God's word. And notice that the writer doesn't say, don't forsake worshiping in song and music. Because he understands when we all get together and we assemble as the body of Christ, we're going to do those things anyway. He says, don't forsake what happens when you get together and you join your lives with somebody else. Can I tell you something this morning, Bridge family? Something happens when we get together assembling as the body of Christ, joining our lives together. And it's different than what happens when I sit at home and watch everybody else do it. And I'm not saying that to be condemning. I'm not saying that at all to, to throw a harsh word at people who are watching online. Man, the green light's on right there, and I know you're watching. But again, the writer is painting a consistent picture of the body of Christ being assembled and connected. Let's go back to the picture of the church as the bride of Christ. You know, we all know that, you know, the scriptures tell us so clearly that he will never leave us, he'll never forsake us, God is with us, Christ is with us, even to the end of the age. I think if we had a true, clear revelation of what it meant to be the body of Christ and what God wants to do in my life and through my life when I am assembled with other believers, we would be really slow to pull away from everybody else. Not only that, but I think if we had a clearer understanding of what it means to be the bride of Christ, and when we stop and consider everything that Jesus has done for us, we would be really slow to pull away from him and his body. I'm getting near the end of the message this morning, but I had to share this because this has just stuck with me over the last three days. I have some guys that I get together with every couple of weeks, and we just chat. We're kind of walking through a book together, and one of the guys in my group said something so cool. He was talking about years ago, he and his wife had gotten some training to be marriage counselors in, in, in a church that they were a part of, and he said that through their training, they learned so much about what it meant to help people be successful in marriage, and he said, one day, I was just blown away at this revelation that my wife got. He said, my wife looks at a couple that was teetering on the edge of divorce. And he said, you understand what a covenant marriage is, what a covenant relationship is, right? And after explaining all that, it really began to set in. See, we are in a covenant relationship with Christ. He shed his blood to buy us into his family so that we could be his bride. And he made this point. He said, my wife was talking to this couple, and he asked the question. He said, you know, you guys are sitting here going through all these reasons why you're considering divorce. And you're listing all the reasons. He goes, she says, but let me ask you a question. Can you name one reason why Christ would ever divorce you? Man, that hit me like a ton of bricks when he said that. Because I think when we, when we lose this picture of what it means to be the bride of Christ, it's so easy to take the church and set it on the shelf, not recognizing that God, Jesus, paid a price for us to be brought into this relationship with the family of God. He paid a price, and sometimes we'll set it aside and we'll neglect the value of what it truly means to be the bride of Christ. Can I tell you something this morning? I don't believe that Jesus would ever walk away from me. So why would we ever walk away from him, his body, 
and the rest of us, which is the bride of Christ. Now, coming back to where we started, I know I made a joke about virtual Christianity. I don't say that at all to be rude or mean-spirited. In closing this morning, I was studying over the last couple days, and I was looking at statistics that have come out over the last year or two about church attendance and people being in church. And there's a handful of things that really stood out to me. There's a Gallup poll that measured church attendance among three generations since 2019. How many know there's been a few things happen since 2019 that have changed the landscape? But this poll measured church attendance in three generations, and it kind of grouped some broad generations together. But watch, it was Gen Z, the youngest, millennials, which groups me into that in this poll, and then boomers, who would be my parents' age and anyone above that. Three generational pictures. And there were two statistics within this poll that were absolutely shocking to me. One was good news, one was bad news. The good news is that since 2019, church attendance increase had risen the most among one demographic. And this might shock you, millennials. From 21% to 39% between 2019 and 2023. And there weren't explanations for this, but I think I know exactly what the explanation is. It's because there's a lot of people in my group, my age group, and my demographic that mom and dad raised them right. And when life got crazy, they ran home. And they said, things are crazy. The world I live in today is not the same world I lived in three years ago, four years ago. Anybody agree with that? And it was like they ran home and said, I know where to find truth, I know where to find safety, and I know where to find shelter when the world around me seems to be falling apart. And I looked at that and I thought, that's fantastic, that's amazing. And it measured church attendance in a lot of different ways. And if you're a disconnected millennial who ran back to church and your first access was online church, I wanna look into the camera and say, I don't care why you're watching or how you got there today, we're just glad that you're with us. And we will never dishonor that and we will never turn our back and not give people the opportunity to tune in. But here's the other side of the coin. This one was heartbreaking. Of the three demographics, those three generations where church attendance declined the most, it was among boomers. And the reason that that broke my heart, because I know number one, there was a lot of people that during the COVID season, you know, you backed off with church for a while, you took your time, you considered all the statistics and the stuff out there, and that was your decision, and we respect that. But I look, I look further into this poll, and it noted the reasons why people are choosing not to, and one of the things that popped up was, my kids aren't in the house anymore, and it seems as though church attendance isn't as big of a deal because I don't have to take them. They're not dependent upon me. And I thought to myself, how sad is that? Because that might be the way that you feel about your kids. But I'll tell you something, God's kids are coming to the house and they need you in their life. Moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, like we need you more than ever before because Satan is totally after the family and that includes the family of God. We need you like we've never needed you before. And I say that this morning, not again, because we need more people to fill seats, that's not the point. It's to say that there are people who are coming to the house of God and they want to connect with God, but they also want to connect with other people. And among those people are multiple generations who have experiences that they don't have. Moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, we need your wisdom. We need your experience. The final thing I'll say about that, you know, we talked about the bride of Christ. Jesus would never leave us. You know, as parents, we want to do the best for our kids. As Christians, if we claim to be Christians, we say, wow, I want my kids to know God. I want them to grow up in a family of faith, a community of faith. And we say that, but can I just look into the camera and say, if it's your choice to be at home all the time and you want your kids to know God, please understand that if the day comes that they don't know God or know how to get to church, maybe it's because that was the example that you set for them. I don't say that to be harsh, but if we want our kids to know God and grow up in a community of faith, then we need to be the ones setting the example. Yeah. We're called to be the children of light, walking in light, but our light is so much greater when we're all shining them together. We're the body of Christ. Can I just say humbly to all of you today, 
Let it never be said that I have no need of you. I need you so terribly. My kids need you. And I believe that somewhere along the line, you need me too. So let's be the body that God intended us to be. And then finally, let's not up for, be afraid to get close to one another. Let's set good examples for the next generation. Listen, church will never be our primary source of joy. Christ will always be that. But God intended to add a whole lot of joy to our lives when we are gathered with other believers. So let's not forsake what happens when we assemble our lives together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you bow your head with me this morning? Father, I know that you put something heavy on my heart and I changed course over the last day or two with this message. But today, my heart is not at all to be condemning, but rather to be encouraging. There are people watching online that are looking to figure out where do I go to find the connection and the life that I need to be connected with Christ and his body. I pray you call them into the house of God. I pray for people who are here today and they've had a hard time committing themselves to it because they recognize sometimes it can be a little bit inconvenient, it can be work, but I pray that we would not choose convenience, which always leads to complacency, but we would choose to put the staple choices down in our life. We will be a part of the body of Christ. We will raise our kids to know God and his people, and we'll take our place in the body of Christ as the bride of Christ. You know, maybe you're here this morning, you've heard this message, and you're like, wow, that's seems kind of directed toward Christians, believers, people who are already a part of the church. That's certainly true, but I want to tell you something this morning. Scripture tells us in Psalm 68 that it's God who takes the solitary, the lonely, or the isolated, and he places them in families. This morning, if you're here and you don't know God or you're disconnected from the body of Christ, I want to tell you, this is a family. We are the family of God. When we get together, we're not exclusive we always open our arms to pull more people in because we believe that God has a plan for every single life that walks through the doors and into our lives. If you're here today and you've never made a decision to come into a relationship with God, we do it by saying yes to Jesus. Jesus, the one who gave his life for us, who died on a cross for our sins so that we could be forgiven. That Jesus didn't just die on the cross. Three days later, God raised him from the dead, conquering death, hell, and the grave so that you and I would not have to face it when this life is over. If we would put our faith in Christ, we would confess him as Lord, we could experience this thing called salvation and come into the family of God, the body of Christ. If you've never done that before, I want to pray a prayer in just a moment. I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. Take your place in the body of Christ this morning. Don't try to do this alone. Let your light shine collectively with all the other lights in this place, and let's do life together in this life into eternity. Let's pray right now, and I want to invite every person in the house to join in. Repeat these words after me and say, Jesus, I thank you for going to the cross for me. I believe that your death was full payment for my sin. And I believe that you were raised to life so that I could have new life too. So today I choose to follow you. From this day forward, I will walk with you all the days of my life into eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now listen, we're almost done with our service, so hang tight, everybody, out of respect to those around you. Just a couple more things we want to do this morning. If you made a decision to follow Christ today, there's no better decision you could ever make in life than to choose to follow Jesus. It means everything. And so we want to help you in your walk with God. We have a little gift, a small tool we want to put in your hands. It's a book called The Next Seven Days to help you get started in your journey of faith. There's a few different ways you can get it. You can walk right down to any one of our prayer teams after service. Listen, Come take advantage of our prayer teams. They are here to pray with people. But if you made that decision today, walk up, let them know you made a decision to follow Christ. You want to get the book, and they'll, get it, they'll give it to you to help you get started in your journey of faith. If you need to go quickly at the end of service, just stop by the next seven days desk. It's right between the glass doors before you exit the building. Let them know you made that decision, and they will get it to you and help you start your journey of faith. If you're watching online, there's instructions right there on the screen. We would love to help you get started walking with God. We're glad you made that decision. Can we put our hands together and welcome some people into God's family today? Thanks for that great message, Pastor Zach. Hey, this is the moment in our service where we get to worship God with our giving, and we'll be out of here in just a minute, but as Pastor Zach was talking, I just kept thinking to myself how incredibly thankful I am for the family of God, for the body of Christ, and what I get to do as a next-gen pastor is interesting because I feel like I, I get 
I get a little taste of everything. You know, it's like when it's like when you're at the barbecue and you, you, you have a chip and you get the mild sauce, you get the hot sauce, you get the medium, you get a taste of everything. And I remember just a few weeks ago, uh, in one day, I, uh, Amber and I met with the mother of one of our bridge kids. And then for lunch, we went and we got lunch with a, a very precious couple in our church who's in their 80s. And then later that afternoon, we went to one of our sixth graders' baseball games. And it was like, I got a little taste of everything. And it's awesome because the body of Christ is incredible. And as Pastor Zach was talking about, you know, the story, I was just picturing little, little Zachary Martin walking through a dark forest all by himself <laughs> with a flashlight. And he talked about how together our collective light shines so much brighter than any of us ever could on our own. And so it is with our giving. And man, I wish, I wish that every single one of you could go on some amazing tour of every little section and aspect of our ministry, from community care to kids, to youth, to young adults, to our school of ministry, to our prayer teams, to our bridge women groups, and just get to see somehow, some way, just a full spectrum view of what your giving does. And can I just tell you, truly, we can accomplish so much more together than we ever could on our own. So thank you for being such generous people. Uh, we serve a generous God, and, and in response, all we know to do is to be generous. So there's a few ways that you can give on the screen. If you came with a physical gift, there's an envelope in your seat back, and you can give that right before you get to the uh, foyer. There's a giving station right there, either side of the exit doors. There's also one near our kids check-in. Hey, um, before we go, Kids Camp is right around the corner. We cannot wait. We have hundreds and hundreds of kids registered already. Last year, we had 706 first to fifth graders. We're believing for even more this year. We're just two weeks away. Hey, if you're planning to register your kids, today's the last day to get in on the pre-registration. That means you will not have to wait in any lines the day you get here for Kids Camp. So make sure to go register today, thebridgechurch.tv. Also, if you're serving at Kids Camp or if you want to serve at Kids Camp, right after this service in the Youth Center, we're gonna have a team meeting. So join us for that. Whether you're already registered to serve or you want to, come over, we'll get you plugged in. Hey, have you enjoyed being in church this morning? Should I say, have you enjoyed being the church this morning? Hey, we love you guys so much. Go in peace and love. We'll see you next week.